Hey, welcome to Apple Insider. It is Andrew here, and I'm going to be talking about the new M2 MacBook Air and comparing it to Apple's M2 13-inch MacBook Pro. And the biggest thing I can tell you right now is that despite a lot of the talk to the contrary, thermal throttling on the MacBook Air isn't really going to matter for almost all of you out there. Let's go ahead and talk about this in a bit more detail, going into the specs, and then really pushing the CPU on both of these machines into hour plus long benchmarks to see how performance is actually impacted by the thermal restrictions. Starting out, these things cost very similar. The MacBook Air with the M2 starts off at $1199, while the M2 MacBook Pro comes in at about $1299. So depending on your specs, these things are very similar in price to one another. Very similar. And I already told you this in another video, but I think most of you out there should probably just buy the MacBook Air, despite the thermal concerns that some of you may already have before we even get to that part. Each of these can be configured with 8, 16, or 24 gigs of memory, and can go up to two terabytes of storage, though they each start off with 256 gigs of storage. It's a terrible base storage configuration. I'm sorry that Apple offers it, and no matter if you choose the MacBook Pro or MacBook Air, jump up to the 500 gig. You won't have the performance concerns of the base storage, and you're going to have plenty more storage for your actual stuff. So get the 500 gig storage option, no matter which Mac you end up picking. The MacBook Pro on my left has a 13.3 inch display, whereas the MacBook Air has a 13.6 inch display. It's just slightly larger because Apple extended the display towards the top, accounting for the menu bar. So you're getting roughly 64 pixels of additional space by choosing the MacBook Air over the MacBook Pro. In terms of resolution, the MacBook Pro is 2560 by 1600 and the MacBook Air is 2560 by 1664. Again, just 64 of additional pixels towards the top that go around the updated camera system. Both displays have 500 nits of peak brightness, and since I had already mentioned the camera system, Apple still only has a 720p camera on the MacBook Pro, whereas the new MacBook Air has a 1080p camera. It's a definite improvement in sharpness while you're taking calls, though regardless of either one, you probably still want to use a dedicated one if you're doing this all the time. Look at something like Continuity Camera coming to Mac OS Ventura, or just pick up a dedicated webcam. There's a whole lot of them out there. The MacBook Pro has two Thunderbolt ports, Type-C, there on the left-hand side, and a headphone jack located on the right-hand side. Looking at the MacBook Air, Apple still has two Thunderbolt ports, but they've added the additional MagSafe 3 port. What's great about that MagSafe 3 port is that you can still use those Thunderbolt ports for accessories. Plug in an external monitor, an SSD, a card reader, whatever it is, while still using MagSafe to charge your laptop. It's pretty beneficial. The headphone jack is also, I believe, slightly better. It's a high impedance headphone jack versus just the standard headphone jack on the 13-inch MacBook Pro. Then there are the keyboards. Keyboards are very similar. They feel pretty much the same as I've been typing on them, but the MacBook Air has a full row of function keys, full size height, versus the touch bar on the MacBook Pro. Which is better? I'll leave that to you guys. I personally love having a good touch bar on my Mac, and I've used it consistently since they were debuted, and I lost it with the new 16-inch MacBook Pro. I'm very sad about it, but the 13-inch MacBook Pro is still one place you can get the touch bar, if you like that. If you prefer the physical keys, then the MacBook Air is going to be the better choice for you. The MacBook Pro is a bit bigger and heavier than the MacBook Air. There are different internals, including actual fans to help cool the CPU and improve performance over sustained loads, and it has a larger battery. You get about 17 hours of web surfing and about 20 hours of watching video. The MacBook Air, on the other hand, will give you about 15 hours of web surfing and 18 hours of watching video. The MacBook Pro only has a set of stereo speakers. The new MacBook Air has a four speaker array. Though both are capable of doing 3D spatial audio and Dolby Atmos, I actually think that the Air might be a little bit better in terms of speakers, but there's a bit better bass possibly here on the MacBook Pro. So it, it's really hard to say which is the better. I think these are more precise and sound better with spatial audio and just overall sound good. These maybe a little bit more bass, just because I think they have a little bit more room to move around in there. But either way, both these have some pretty decent speakers for a laptop. Okay, let's talk about what you all really want to talk about, the benchmarks. 
I first started out with Geekbench 5. Now the MacBook Pro here, again with the M2, has a 1941 and an 8966 on the single and multi-core tests. Pretty good numbers for the M2. If we go to the MacBook Air, it got a 1909 and an 8547. So not too far off, slightly lower scores here for the MacBook Air versus the MacBook Pro. Now let's go ahead and look at graphics with Geekbench 5's compute test running under metal. In this case, the MacBook Pro scored a 30,070 compared to the MacBook Air with a 26,425. But the difference is that this, the MacBook Pro, is a 10-core GPU, whereas the MacBook Air is only running an 8-core GPU because these are both base models. If you were to upgrade the MacBook Air to the 10-core GPU, you'd likely see better performance results in comparison to the MacBook Pro. So it is possible to get higher graphics scores here. It's just the 8-core GPU versus a 10-core GPU. Both are the M2, and for these basic benchmarks, they do really well. Now let's look at the sustained performance. I ran Cinebench R23 a total of eight times, eight consecutive runs on both machines, taking well over an hour to perform. Now by doing these, there was a couple things that I was watching. So as time would go on and I had done multiple, multiple runs that were maxing out the CPU, I wanted to see how the temperature of the chip would fluctuate and how the performance would be impacted. So basically over time, as there's more stress put on the CPU, is it gonna get hot enough that the scores are gonna to start to go down or is it's natural cooling or fan cooling going to be able to help offset that and keep the performance higher? And I think the results were really interesting. So let's go ahead and start off with just the first test of running both machines. After one test, the MacBook Air scored an 8,210 and the MacBook Pro scored an 8,636. So immediately after one test, I definitely saw some better performance of the MacBook Pro over the MacBook Air, thanks to the fans that were in there. The fans eventually did turn on going between 3,500 to 4,000 RPMs, though I honestly couldn't even hear them, especially with just normal background noises in the studios. The fans were absurdly quiet, which was a pretty cool thing to find out here on the MacBook Pro. But it was when I ran this test more and more times that I started to see the pattern of what was going on. The MacBook Pro was able to keep its clock speed pretty much the same, sticking around 3.2 gigahertz the entire time. I saw the temperature of the CPU getting up to about 212 to 214 the entire time. That's where it would max out. Basically just the point of boiling water is where Apple put the cap at. This used to be a little bit lower for the M1, so Apple did raise the thermal cap of these chips, allowing it to run safely at slightly higher temperatures, which combined with the improvements to the clock speed, overall, we're just getting better performance out of the M2 than the M1. But looking at a cooled M2 versus a non-cooled M2, it's a different story. So the M2 on the MacBook Air was starting to see a bit of a hit as the tests were running further. You can see in these charts how I started off getting a score over 8,000, and by the end, it was around 7,500. Even then, the clock speed had gone from about 3 gigahertz all the way down to 2.6 gigahertz on those final tests after eight runs of Cinebench. So Apple was trying to cool the processor. You can see even the temperature started higher at like 221 degrees Fahrenheit and had dropped to 208 by the end. It had really slowed down the clock speed, trying to pull that temperature back resulting in lower scores and lower temperatures and the lower frequencies. So it was really interesting to see that. So by that eighth test, I was still getting almost 8,600 on the M2 13-inch MacBook Pro, but only 7,529 on the MacBook Air. So almost a thousand point difference, thousand point delta between the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro after running Cinebench eight times. So here's the thing. I know a lot of you out there may already be saying, clearly there is a thermal issue with the MacBook Air and no one should buy it. Instead, they should opt for the 13-inch MacBook Pro with the M2 or the 14-inch MacBook Pro that doesn't have such thermal problems. But that's just not the case. It's not because these are not emblematic of real world usage. In very, 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 very few situations, 
Will you be out there trying to run your Mac at 100% CPU utilization for over an hour? It took at about 10 minutes per run. It took, um, and there was eight runs, so an hour and 20 minutes of running these tests consecutively to get these numbers to fall that much. You won't be doing that unless you're doing something that's that crazy, but at that point, you probably shouldn't be looking at a MacBook Air or entry-level MacBook Pro. You should be jumping up to a 14 or a 16 or a Mac Studio or a Mac Pro, something that is capable of that power, not these entry-level units. When you're looking at just your typical standard performance, those earlier tests, those earlier benchmarks, the Geekbench results, there's very little difference. The single core tests are coming back pretty much the same between these two, and that's what you're gonna be doing when you're opening tabs and applications and jumping between things and editing things and being in emails. Every task that most people are doing out there are not gonna be impacted by these thermal limitations whatsoever. In fact, I think it's impressive that it took an hour and 20 minutes to get these scores to drop that much on the MacBook Air and is very emblematic of the actual usage that people put on these machines. This is not a real world use test of the MacBook Air. It's a stress test, maxing out the CPU for almost an hour and a half. And I'm sorry, but nothing that most people do is going to do that. So I think it's perfectly safe to go for the MacBook Air instead of the MacBook Pro because I think you get a lot more value. You get a better screen, a bigger screen, you get additional ports, you get better headphone jacks, you get this redesigned, thinner body, lighter weight, and can even be a little bit cheaper. I think it makes more sense for a lot of people to go with the MacBook Air than the MacBook Pro, despite the 13-inch MacBook Pro getting better performance over time. But let me know what you guys think. Do you agree or do you disagree? Let's have a civilized discussion down below in the comments or on Twitter at Andrew underscore OSU. And if you'd like to pick up the MacBook Air or MacBook Pro, there are links for you down below in the description. Otherwise, stay tuned. I have a lot more videos coming your way.